the Strange West Podcast. This is your host and word hustler extraordinaire, Trent Tano. Bringing us in, as always, with their rendition of Eno Maricones for a few dollars more, is the mighty Mitch Polzak and the Royal Deuces. If you like your guitar slingers like you like your gun slingers, head on over to MitchPolzak.com. That's Mitch, P-O-L-Z-A-K dot com. Today's podcast continues the Cowboys vs. Nazi adventure with Chapter 7 of Paris High Noon by Trent Tano, yours truly. You can get a copy today at ParisHighNoon.com, both paperback and ebook at ParisHighNoon.com. You can also get mustache and Paris High Noon t-shirts at Society6.com slash Trent Tano. And as always, thanks again to James K. Doyle for lending us his time and his talent to Paris High Noon. And now without further ado, here is Chapter 7 of Paris High Noon. Chapter 7, Desperados. It was hard on Catfish not having any coffee before trekking across the Norman countryside. Coffee was a simple luxury that softened hard living, and its lack didn't bode well for the rest of the morning. The old cowboy rubbed his sore back. His whole body felt stiff, worn out, and useless. Luckily, it had been a warm night, and there was enough straw to soften up the ground. Although St. Jude, Jean, and Patrice had a hard time sleeping with all the sneezing going on. Catfish was taking a chance, rambling around in broad daylight with the Nazis on their tail, but he didn't know the country well enough to take the bocage mazes of the Norman countryside at night with green boys used to gas lights and feather beds. Come on, old man, St. Jude said. Time to shoot some buffalo. I'd love to shoot a buffalo, Catfish replied, taking out his flask for a morning nip. That way, I'd have a nice soft robe to wrap up in. Whenever it got cold on the farm, Patrice said, I would go to the barn and sleep next to the milk cow. St. Jude laughed and slapped his hand on his knee. And how much did you have to pay her to throw up her tail? Catfish and Jean joined in the laughter at Patrice's expense. Patrice threw up his hands and looked away, figuring to keep all anecdotes to himself for the time being. Catfish got up and dusted off his pants with his cowboy hat. All right, boys, let's get going. Where to, Patrice said. It was a good question. The first good question any of them had posed to Catfish since they left Paris. Since the shootout, Catfish's main goal had been to get away from Paris before the Germans assembled a posse. Now he had to find a place to rest and regroup. If they went to Vichy, the Flicks would arrest them and hand them over to the Nazis. But Catfish smelled an opportunity right where they were. The bulk of the Wormacht was staring across the channel like coyotes, waiting for a sign of weakness from their British prey. Normandy would be the last place to look for a gang of outlaws. We'll go until we find the right spot to stop. And what will that look like, St. Jude said, a chateau with a well-stocked wine cellar? I'll know it when I see it, Catfish said, with some irritation. He could tell from the flat farmland and thin trees spotting the hills, they weren't going to find it close by. After washing breakfast down with well water, the outlaws left the shelter of the barn for the fields and the hedgerows of the Norman hill country, where the golden wheat fields would soon be ready for the reaping. They skirted farms, trekking through the woods and staying away from the roads as much as possible. Crossing roads was tedious, with catfish sending Jean or Patrice to scout the other side. Patrice thought that catfish was using him as bait and feared stumbling into a gaggle of Germans. Jean was happy to take the chore, 
and went about it in the manner he felt a cowboy should. Throughout the day, there seemed to be a strange calm across the countryside. For all the talk of war and combat, there was little sign of either. From time to time, Catfish spotted the dusty trail of a truck convoy full of soldiers and their equipment heading east to the other side of the Rhine. Despite the hardship of the trail, Catfish felt some of his youthful vigor returning. The countryside around him was some place between tame and wild, going back beyond the age of Rome. It reminded Catfish of the days when he lived with his family in Dakota Territory, where the fields of wheat flowed like a golden sea, the earth smelled of vegetable gardens, and the perfumed flower beds bloomed from a land slowly tamed of its natural beauty. When Catfish retired to Paris, it was always in the back of his mind that he would take one last look at the endless plains and breathe that crisp air before they laid the sod ore. But he knew now that he would never again see his beloved West with its wild canyons and plains of hardy grass or smell the sage as the morning sun burned off the dew. John noticed the melancholy in Catfish's eyes. It was the same look his mother wore after work in the cafe was over and the evening chores were done. The sight of the old cowboy getting misty reminded John of the life he was leaving. He wouldn't miss the cafe. He had longed to be done with the world of coffee, tea, and the whole encumbrance of polite society. It was Moo he longed for. In spite of her cruel teasing, she was the only bright spot in his life. If Jean got the chance to see her again, he would take it, no matter what the consequences. They walked until noon, taking a rest under the shade of an old oak tree near a small brook. Catfish took off his gun belt but made sure it was within arm's reach. The weight of the pistol had rubbed a sore spot on his thigh, so he took out his bandana and tied it around his leg for extra padding. At times he wished he had been shot down in his youth. He figured it would have made the rest of his life easier. He'd be a legend of the Wild West instead of an old man trying to be something he hadn't been in decades. Jean gazed at the pistol snug in its holster, like a sleeping rattlesnake. He felt weak, almost alone, and not part of the gang without a gun. The way he saw it, he proved he had what it takes to handle a gun when he blew out the sergeant's spine. But the feel of iron on his hip still eluded him. Catfish had taken his boots off and had his bare feet in the cool water of the brook. Jean let a finger slip along the wood handle, tracing the smooth grain to the cold metal of the hammer. Touching a man's gun is like touching his woman, Catfish said with a grin. Jean flushed and put his hand underneath his legs. Catfish took the gun out of the holster and emptied the cylinder, putting the bullets into his vest pocket. He leaned over and handed the pistol to Jean. Next time, just ask me. Jean took the gun. It felt like the iron nails and wood of the cross of Christ in his hand, capable of giving both redemption and vengeance. Jean cocked the hammer back. It made a clear click that seemed to fill the air in France. His hand was steady as his index finger put more pressure on the trigger until the hammer fell. It was a hard sound. The pistol felt heavy in his palm. Catfish watched the young man's face as the hammer struck. John's eyes didn't flinch. 
He had hoped the taste of the gun would be a foul one for the boy. But as it was for most people, it turned into a powerful opiate. Catfish had let himself believe the shooting of the sergeant was a reflex. But it wasn't a lucky shot. It hit square in the middle. Makes you feel like God, don't it? He reached out his hand and Gene gave the pistol back. Or maybe like the devil. It makes me feel safe, Jean said. Like I have a guardian angel close by. A friend I can count on. Catfish scoffed. This gun has gotten me into trouble many times and rarely gotten me out. But I was always glad I had it. If it's a friend, then it's a friend you don't want to call out for too many favors. After replacing the bullets, Catfish had gotten up to lead them to a place to rest for the night when a truck engine roared up the road. They ducked back into the bocage just as a truck rumbled to a stop in front of them. It was a French army truck with a canvas cover over the bed. Two men got out of the cab, a pudgy sergeant who drove and a needle-thin officer riding shotgun. Come on, you sons of whores, the sergeant bellowed. He reached into the cab and brought out a submachine gun. He used the butt to bang on the side of the truck. Two more soldiers dropped the tailgate from the inside and jumped out. Rifles strung across their backs. Once on the ground, they unslung the rifles and pointed them with fixed bayonets at the tailgate. Four men in ratty uniforms spilled out, their feet and hands shackled. Last time to take a piss before we hit the prison. Breathe the free air while you can, you bastards, the officer said. His cap rode high on his head, and his right hand rested on his hip near the butt of his pistol. I'll piss on your grave, coward, said a stout prisoner with dark rings around his eyes. Then I'll cut your mother's throat and piss on her, too. One of the soldiers hit the foul-mouthed man in the back of the knee with his rifle butt. The other struck a hard blow to the prisoner's kidneys. The big man fell, gritting his teeth and getting no sympathy from the other three. I'd like a cigarette, mon capitaine, a dapper-looking prisoner said. Despite his rude clothes, he kept his hair neat with a shoestring mustache that sagged around the corners of his mouth. You'll get my boot up your ass, the sergeant said and pushed the prisoner near the ditch. Now shut up and make water. The three men waddled over to the side of the road, but didn't do what they were told. They expected a bullet in the back and didn't figure on dying with their peckers hanging out. The sergeant pulled the bolt back on his submachine gun, and the two guards walked slowly away. I know those guys. St. Jude said in a whisper. The one on the ground is Hammer. He's the reason why I got sent to prison. I'm glad I got a front row seat to his execution. St. Jude was tempted to step right up and shoot Hammer himself. Even during happier times, when Toothy was boss, the two gangsters never got along. They were young bulls that didn't mind tangling horns to prove who would be lead steer. Who's the other one, Catfish asked. The one with the blonde hair is Quick Billy, great pickpocket, and good with locks. He ran with Toothy off and on. If he was so good with locks, how come he's in shackles, Catfish asked. They ought to call him Slow William. St. Jude didn't argue the point. We're not going to let them get killed, John said. Fuck them, St. Jude said. I'm not risking my neck for those bastards. Let's get out of here. Hold on, St. 
Catfish said. We could use some extra guns and fingers for the triggers. You sneak around and cover the guards. Patrice, if anyone tries to get away in the truck, shoot the engine. What if I hit the driver? Patrice said. Although a soldier, he didn't like the idea of killing anyone if he could help it. That's his worry, Catfish said. Not letting that truck get away is yours. What about me, Jean said, feeling useless without a gun. You stay here and keep an eye on the road, just in case someone else decides to stop for a piss. Jean nodded, but kept his eyes on Catfish. Catfish drew the heavy peacemaker. Carefully, he eased out of the bushes in front of the truck. The sergeant was walking slowly behind the three men. The stout fellow was still laid out on his belly, eyes closed. Got change for a five? Catfish said from behind the sergeant. The sergeant turned his head and caught the barrel of the forty-five across his temple. The same swift action brought the pistol in line with the officer, who was too surprised to do or say much of anything. St. Jude popped out from behind the two guards. Once they realized they were surrounded, they dropped their guns and raised their hands. Jean came out from the bushes and picked up the submachine gun. Patrice came out of the trees, took the officer's gun belt, and threw it near the ditch. Caught you with your pants down again, Quick Billy, St. Jude said. Quick Billy turned around. Well, if it ain't St. Jude... I heard you were dead. It'll take more than a few bombs to take out the saint. What's with the uniform? You get patriotic fever and decide to join the army? Quick Billy laughed. The bastards cut us a deal. Fight for France or hang from a rope. Only we did more running than fighting. One of the prisoners, a tall man with coal black hair and rough hands, picked up one of the rifle's the guards had dropped. He pointed the muzzle at the young soldier and pulled the trigger. Nothing happened. You owe me a hundred francs, he said. I told you their guns weren't loaded. Hammer struggled to one knee. Good to see you, St. Jude. If you didn't have a gun on me, I would pay you back for fucking up the lion job. St. Jude held the automatic at Hammer's head. Me? My plan was perfect. You're the one who let the flicks get the drop on us. They sent me up for 20 years. If anyone's going to get some payback, it's my fist taking it out of your face. Hammer balled up his hands into fist. You don't know your brain from your bowels. Whenever Toothy needed something done or someone done in, he turned to me. Whenever he wanted to take a shit, he asked you. The two bulls squared off, ready to lock horns. Hammer tackled St. Jude, knocking the pistol out of his hand, and the two went rolling in the dust. The gangsters formed a circle around them, cheering and shouting. Hammer rolled on top of St. Jude, who squirmed under the bruiser. Hammer cocked his arm back and threw a glancing blow off St. Jude's face. He was going for another when he heard a click of metal on metal near his ear. Catfish shoved the barrel of the peacemaker in Hammer's face. Get up slow, son, so we can have a conversation. Hammer looked down the train tunnel pointed right between his eyes. The big man got up slow and easy. St. Jude rolled over and went for his gun. Catfish swung the barrel to St. Jude. Calm down, he said. You only did three years, and God knows a few more would have done you some good. The old cowboy kept the peacemaker pointed at the two bulls. All right, girls, I suggest we save the dancing for later. We need to get out of here in a quick, quiet hurry. Well, I, my new friend, am glad for the rescue, 
the dapper man said. He wet his finger and smoothed out his mustache. I say we find some wine and women to celebrate. What about the other soldiers? Jean asked. Kill them, Hammer said. But they're soldiers of France, Patrice said. Granted, he didn't think much of the army. But they were still Frenchmen and deserved some sort of pardon. What has France done for us? Hammer said. Besides, these cowards have sided with the Bosch. They would sell us out the first chance they got. Are we really going to kill them? Jean asked Catfish. Go down the road and keep an eye out. Catfish said. Fire a shot if someone's coming. But, the submachine gun shook in Jean's sweaty palms. Go on, do what you're told. You too, Patrice. You don't need to see this. Jean and Patrice went down the road in opposite directions. Both young men walked slowly without looking back. Jean held the submachine gun but he didn't like the feel of it at the moment. All this time wanting a gun of his own, and now that he finally had it in his hands, he just wanted to be rid of it. The man with the coal black hair took the bayonet off the rifle and walked towards the two guards. I'll take care of these guys, he said, and thrust the blade into the stomach of one of the young guards. The soldier fell to his knees raising his hands to protect himself, but it did no good. The blade slashed his face and neck, and the guard crumpled to his side to bleed out. The other guard broke into a run. The dapper man tripped him, and the guard fell flat on his face. The coal-haired man ran over and jumped on the young guard's back, bloody bayonet in hand. Just like pigs, he said. Then he lifted the guard's neck and stabbed at the windpipe. Blood sprayed from the slashed artery. Some of it splashed on the dapper man's shoe. Sloppy cunt, he hissed. Look what you did. If you're upset about your shoes, I can cut off the captain's leg and you can have his boots. The dapper man smiled. I really need a woman. But I guess... Buggering a skinny-ass officer will do as well, huh, mon capitaine? Fuck you like you were going to fuck us. The captain turned his wide eyes to Catfish. Please, monsieur, these men are killers, thieves, and worse. You should have kept them in jail then, mister. Catfish regretted the killing, but knew from experience these men needed to spill blood. I got something special for you, mon capitaine, Hammer said. He took one of the empty rifles and struck the butt into the captain's midsection. The captain fell over with the wind knocked out of him. Hammer looked over at St. Jude. He took the rifle and smashed the buttstock on the captain's head until gray matter spilled out onto the dirt road. Hammer stood up like a grizzly after a kill, threw his shoulders back, and tossed the rifle at St. Jude's feet. He walked over to the ditch, took the officer's pistol belt, and tried to snap it on. But the outlaw's girth was much more pronounced than the skinny captain's. So he slung the loop over his shoulder, making sure the butt of the pistol was in easy reach. Quick Billy was next to clean the carcass. He took a wallet and a silver cigarette case with a built-in lighter. He lit himself a smoke, and the others made a grab for the rest. Soon they finished the first smokes they would had in a long time. The coal-haired man walked with the bloody bayonet in his hands toward Catfish, who fingered his pistol as he approached. The man tucked the blade in his belt and held out his blood-speckled hand. Jacques Pale. The other is Louis Amon. Thanks for freeing us 
from these yellow bastards. Catfish still held the gun in his hand. He didn't like that Jacques didn't wipe the blade clean before tucking it away. Pleasure to meet you, boys. Give me a woman, and I'll show you what pleasure looks like, Louis said with a laugh. Catfish turned his eyes to Hammer, along with the muzzle of the forty-five. I hope you and St. Jude can settle your differences. I don't mind you two killing each other, but I would prefer it if it were done quietly. No sense in sending up smoke signals and getting the whole bunch of us knocked off. I won't shoot, Hammer said. He turned to St. Jude. But it ain't over between us. What about the lump of shit on the ground, Quick Billy said. The sergeant was still knocked out and not moving. Catfish walked over to the unconscious sergeant. Want me to kill him, Shock said. After seeing you at work, I wouldn't trust you to butcher a buffalo, Catfish replied. He pulled his bowie knife and straddled the sergeant's shoulders he looked up at Jacques. The edges of his cobalt eyes froze like a deep lake in winter. Catfish lifted the sergeant's unconscious head up by the hair, exposing the windpipe. The blade sliced right through the meat and tendons. The sergeant's body jerked a few times and then didn't move anymore. Catfish wiped the blade on the dead man's shirt, still eyeing Jacques. Now, that's how you cut a man's throat. St. Jude stood in silence. Although the old cowboy shot down six German soldiers, he never thought Catfish could be so cold-blooded. Catfish looked at Hammer, Quick Billy, Louis, and especially Jacques. Now I freed you boys, so in a way I own you. Lucky for y'all, I ain't one to hold a man in bondage. So here are your choices. You can either skedaddle on your own or stick with me. Now, let me tell you the news. You won't last long with the Bosch running around. If you do stick with me, I'll see you through this, and you might make some money in the process. But you do as I say when I say it. I don't expect you fellows to be choir boys, but I do expect you to be professionals. Take it from a son of a bitch who's been doing this since your mothers were sucking on the teeth. The outlaws nodded in agreement. None of them knew what to do with their newfound freedom, but they figured, left to their own judgment, they would probably squander it. Within a couple of minutes, Quick Billy freed himself and the rest of the prisoners. Louie took the other bayonet, but not the rifle since they had no bullets and would be an unwanted burden. They searched the two dead soldiers' pockets, taking billfolds, watches, and a half a pack of cigarettes. After they were done picking over the bodies, they dragged them out into the wheat field. Catfish called Jean and Patrice back. You boys go through the truck and grab what you can, he said. Jean put the submachine gun down to grab a box from inside the bed. Quick Billy strode over and picked up the gun. Hey, that's mine. Kid, you should be picking your nose. The hard men laughed at Jean's expense. They took what they could carry from the truck. St. Jude found a case of tin pinard wine rations in the cab. They made Jean carry a five-gallon jug of water and Patrice a case of rations through the brush and bocage. Jean and Patrice were the low men on the totem pole and would have to settle for being pack mules for the time being. The outlaws set out across an open field for the woods. Catfish turned around and put his hands on his hips. The way you boys are plodding around, a blind man could track you. Follow my trail and keep in a single line. 
the men moved into a line and followed the old cowboy into the forest. The woods and bramble grew thicker. From time to time, catfish used a fallen branch to brush away their footsteps or led them through a creek to hide their trail. After hiking five miles, the gang stopped. Another warm summer night had settled along the Norman countryside. Patrice handed out tin rations of boiled beef, rock-hard biscuits, and dehydrated soup. It was a rough late supper with only warm water from the jug and rough pinard to wash it all down, but no one complained. One by one, they fell asleep. As soon as there was a choir of snores, Catfish got up and moved from the camp to be by himself. His promise to the outlaws to see them through the war was as hasty as his notion of walking out of the hotel to kill some Germans. But a promise is a promise, even if it meant his responsibility to hiccup had to wait. Catfish hoped his pard was sipping wine while wiping his forehead with a handkerchief. Much as he wanted to grab a horse and ride back to Paris, he would have to wait and hope Hiccup's fate wasn't the same that befell Lee. As for the gang, Catfish had had to deal with worse. The two killers, Louis and Jacques, would be unpredictable and hard to control. They could be a liability later on, but for now he had to keep them around. Catfish didn't like that he had to kill the French sergeant either. But he had to prove the point to Jacques that he was a hard son of a bitch when he needed to be. He was more concerned now St. Jude and Hammer would play together. So far they had been too busy running around ducking the Germans to test each other. But one thing Catfish learned on the outlaw trail was that sooner or later old scores between men would be settled, buried, or both. Catfish heard a twig snap, and in the same second his forty-five was in his hand. It's only me, John said in a low voice. I couldn't sleep either. Is it all right if I sit with you? Come on in, son, Catfish said, putting the peacemaker back into the holster. The trees had blocked out the light of the moon, and Jean stumbled forward through the brush like a boy raised on the teat of a gaslight city. He had a million questions, and he wanted to ask Catfish because the sound of the old man's voice comforted him. He never knew men could come as hard and cold as the ones that slept only a hundred feet away. But he noticed Catfish was listening hard to something he couldn't sense. After ten minutes of nervous waiting, John finally spoke up. What are you listening to? I don't hear anything. Catfish looked over at the boy and smiled. Son, when you don't hear anything, it means something is coming. John looked around in the dark. Settle down, son. There's plenty out there that should be there. Now stop being scared and listen. What do you hear? I hear crickets, John said. I hear the sounds of the night. Catfish grabbed a stone and threw it into the darkness. The sound stopped, and John held his breath. Soon the crickets picked up where they left off. Critters have better sense when it comes to staying alive than people do, Catfish said. You'll be better off paying attention to them and not your brother and his peers. At the thought of the gang, Jean fell back into his sulk. I don't like them, especially Louis. You should shoot him. If I shoot him, then the rest of those killers might think I want to shoot them, and then they'll shoot me, and then they'll kill you. If I had a gun, I would shoot him, John said. Catfish pulled out his pistol and handed it to Jean, but he didn't take it. Catfish put the pistol back in the holster. 
You'll get a gun soon enough. And then you'll get your chance. This is a gang of sinners, not saint. You don't like it? Go back to Paris. The old cowboy had to say it out loud so the facts would wash away any quiet delusions Jean might have about being a swashbuckling bandit. Killers and rapists were part of the territory, along with death and guilt. Jean didn't say any more for the rest of the night and was awake to watch the sunrise. He hadn't learned to sleep with one eye open. And welcome back to the Strange West Podcast. Uh, once again, this is your host and word hustler extraordinaire, Trentano. Well, that wraps up Chapter 7 of Paris High Noon. Uh, want to find out what happens next? Then go to parishighnoon.com. There's only one place for Cowboys vs. Nazis, and that's parishighnoon.com. T-shirts are available through society6.com slash Trentano. Paris High Noon t-shirts as well as mustache t-shirts available at society6.com slash Trentano. And thanks again to James K. Dill for lending us his time and his talent to Paris High Noon. Sending us out as always with their rendition of Eno Maricones for a few dollars more is the Mighty Mitch Polzak and the Royal Deuces. Thank you for uh, listening and we'll see you next week. Happy trails.